From Here to the Stars. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Dr. Mason Peck of Cornell University, where his research and teaching focus on aerospace engineering and systems engineering. Our guest today is Dr. Mason Peck of Cornell University, where his research and teaching focus on aerospace engineering and systems engineering. He served as NASA's chief technologist from 2011 through 2013. Since 2011, his work with NASA has included collaborations in space policy development with the executive and legislative branches of the U.S. government. Examples include new technology initiatives at the agency, including the Asteroid Grand Challenge and the program in Foundational Investments in in Engineering Science. Thank you, Doctor, for taking the time for this interview. It's great to be with you. Thank you. I mentioned just now in the intro the Asteroid Grand Challenge. For those unfamiliar, what's all that about? Uh, In a nutshell, the idea was to show that we can be smarter than the dinosaurs. Uh, Famously, uh, the dinosaurs, uh, more or less, uh, expired when an asteroid hit the Earth uh, somewhere uh, near the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, the resulting uh, blackout of the sun and some other things uh, ruined their uh, their day. So uh, our our goal would be to uh, do better and specifically know where all the asteroids that could uh, obliterate life on Earth are, um, know what to do about them, and, uh, and use sort of public interest to make that happen. So it was a grand challenge in the sense that we were challenging the nation and possibly the world uh, to uh, to help us achieve that goal. This overall construct of a challenge is a little different from, let's say, a typical NASA program or project where you might build a spacecraft to do a specific thing. Uh, in this case, this grand challenge was a bit more open, a little bit more uh, maybe democratic is the word. Uh, that was designed specifically to leverage all the, uh, the the brilliant ideas from the crowd. So in some sense, a kind of a, a crowdsourced approach. Uh, we had all sorts of ideas about how this could come about. Uh, the grand challenge, uh, you know, sort of faded away, honestly, um, after the Obama administration. It was, after all, part of NASA, and, and NASA is part of the executive branch. So some of the agency's priorities tend to shift every four or eight years. Uh, and this is one of them. It's not that the problem itself uh, really has changed in character. It would still be great to know that we could prevent uh, death by asteroid. And we've made progress along those lines. The DART mission, for example, is one of those uh, that uh, is meant for planetary defense. But the asteroid grand challenge as such, uh, I hope it had an impact. I hope, uh, no pun intended there, <laughs> I hope that it uh, enthused some people about uh, uh, looking into the heavens and thinking about our place in them. Hmm. Okay. Do you have any notion of uh, how much progress was actually made? I mean, maybe how many, what percentage of asteroids that would endanger the Earth have been detected? Well, at this point, it's over 90% of the asteroids that could really destroy the Earth. That is to say, obliterate life on Earth as we know it. You know, roughly that uh, Shistulub uh, asteroid I was talking about before, that, that scale. Um, so 90% have been found, not all uh, as a result of the Grand Challenge, but definitely I think the Grand Challenge raised some awareness. Um, at the same time, uh, at least during the Obama administration, let me back up a little bit. So I was chief technologist of NASA during the Obama administration, uh, and I'm not being political here, I'm just saying that's when it happened. Um, during that administration, um, there was a priority placed on these kinds of you know, kind of grand challenges, and there were a variety we could talk about. But to get back to your question, um, there was already a planetary defense program underway at NASA. Uh, During the Obama administration, that uh, the funding increased almost doubled every year uh, to this to the point where we are now, where it is firmly uh, entrenched in the science mission directorate at NASA and is producing results like, again, the DART mission. So DART, of course, is the uh, mission to um, approach rendezvous with and impact an asteroid and demonstrate that we have the ability to redirect an asteroid uh, with at least the momentum that exists in a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly one of the ways in which we could do this. There's other ways to go. But anyway, I think that DART um, and a couple of other programs or projects related to that uh, are, uh, are the offspring, to some degree, of that asteroid grand challenge. Uh, It's, I don't think you can trace a specific origin, let's say, for DART, back to the Grand Challenge as such. It's more a uh, placing of emphasis on the problem that I think really had a good impact. 
Okay. So the grand challenge itself is over, but its impact has spread through, I suppose, not just NASA, but also other agencies around the world. I would like to think that's true. Yes. And, and so the, uh, the consequence of bringing this to everyone's attention is to, I think, to kind of firmly place it uh, among the priorities that we have in space. Uh, it's it's difficult, I think, for certainly for the public to keep in mind what's maybe important in space. And you hear things like uh, asteroids are a danger or the odds of dying are very, very low or you know, where is the truth in that? So I think that the communications benefit of framing a problem in the form of a grand challenge is pretty clear. And so in the case of the asteroid grand challenge, laying out specifically the problem Again, we'd like to find a large fraction of those Earth-crossing asteroids that could that could uh, obliterate life. Um, and you know what can we do about them? Laying it out that way, I think, makes it clear for folks so that uh, whether or not you agree, at least you know what you're voting for. Okay, okay. Uh, during the last few years, there have been a lot of discussion and research within the interstellar exploration community about the idea of sending spacecraft to other star systems in the form of tiny microchips. You've done research concerning using microchips as satellites in Earth orbit and beyond. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far back as 2007, you were awarded $75,000 uh, $75, by NASA's Institute for Advanced Concepts, uh, Concepts, NIAC, to study how a fleet of, of microchip-sized space probes in Earth orbit might propel themselves into the interplanetary transport network and possibly as far as Jupiter's moon Europa. Talk about that particular chipset project, as well as your other projects involving tiny chipsets. Yeah, the chipset uh, idea has been one of my favorites. Um, it extrapolates uh, the current state of the art where it's not difficult these days to build a spacecraft the size of a grapefruit. We call them CubeSats. Uh, universities all over the nation actually build these senior projects from students uh, fly in space now, thanks to CubeSats. Uh, so that's an idea that... Uh, has come, and I won't say has gone, it's still very much current, uh, but also it's an idea from the 2000-ish timeframe. Chipsets, I think, are maybe the 2020s version of that. It's not They're not about shrinking an existing spacecraft, because after all, you can't shrink some things. You can't shrink aperture and get what you want. Uh, you can't shrink the distance between Earth and the spacecraft. So there's always going to be a certain amount of power to transmit a certain amount of data that's unavoidable. But things you can shrink are just the geometry of the spacecraft. And in doing so, you allow the spacecraft to uh, experience what we think of as perturbations, like uh, solar radiation pressure or magnetic effects or some other more exotic ones, experience those more strongly than their larger uh, brothers and sisters. So the idea with the chipset at the time and that you're talking about the 2007 study was uh, could we create a spacecraft that was so susceptible to some of these perturbation effects that that could in fact govern the flight dynamics. So let me be specific. In the case of that study, uh, they had, we were looking at the Lorentz force and I'm sure your listeners are aware that uh, that's the force that acts on a charged particle, an electrically charged particle traveling through a magnetic field. For uh, old farts like you and me, that means uh, imagine an old uh, cathode ray tube, an old TV set, right? There were electrons traveling from the from a kind of emitter in the back of the set toward uh, the front of the tube, which maybe had a phosphor on it. And the result was that the, the location of the electrons um, impact would, would light up something and that turned into uh, the light that you see when you look at a TV. Well, the, the location, that path, that was driven by magnetic fields. So inside a TV set or a CRT, um, this magnetic uh, device would, would direct the electron beam and paint the electrons over the surface of the screen. That idea that electrons can be uh, deflected by magnetic fields is the basis for this uh, this idea. Uh, the Lorentz force is that force that acts on electrons or actually any charged particle. But when I say particle, I really am thinking of things like uh, atomic uh, uh, scale particles, ions, or maybe some atomic particles like, uh, like electrons. Uh, a spacecraft is not subatomic, right? <laughs> so instead, how close can you get? And the answer is you could probably you could probably, without stretching the imagination too much, create a spacecraft uh, that is on the scale of milligrams, certainly two grams. Uh, now, that's a wide range. That's a factor of a thousand. Um, but you appreciate that uh, a gram scale spacecraft is already a factor of thousands smaller than a CubeSat, which is uh, roughly one kilogram, one liter of spacecraft. I'm gesturing because it's a it's a 10 by 10 uh, by 10 cube. All right. So that's very small given the state of the art, given what's possible. 
those very small spacecraft can't do much because after all, again, they haven't got much aperture. They haven't got much power. They can't communicate particularly well. But in aggregate, maybe these chips, these chipsets uh, could do a lot. And even if what they do is the same number of bits, let's say, of science per hour uh, as a larger spacecraft, it's a very different kind of science. It's the kind of science where you're measuring distributed phenomena, like let's say uh, large swaths of the uh, solar electromagnetic uh, field, okay? Uh, or maybe the Earth's uh, uh, plasma sphere or something like this. A single point measurement is probably best done by a single large in-situ spacecraft, but a large set of measurements over a temporally and spatially distributed uh, area, um, that's probably best done by a lot of small sensors that uh, where you aggregate the data. All right, so that was the basic idea. So the, the force we were looking at, that Lorentz force, turns out to be uh, the force, the most strong, uh, most strongly responsive force for a spacecraft when they're very tiny. And it's a bit of a long story. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, some forces scale with uh, length, some scale with area, some scale with volume. Like, for example, gravity scales with volume. If you assume a constant mass density object, uh, the more volume you have, the more it's attracted by gravity, right? In the case of uh, the Lorentz force, it's uh, it goes with the linear dimension. So what you have here is a force, let's say the Lorentz force, uh, re with respect to gravity, Okay, which goes with the, the cube of distance, you have uh, first power over a cube. So you have one over the uh, square of something. The smaller this object gets, the larger that ratio gets in a hurry. So it turns out the Lorentz force, for example, dominates the path of uh, small particles in Jupiter's rings. And that's why you have the, the peculiar resonances and other things that you discover in Jupiter's rings. Um, also Saturn's rings to an extent, but mostly Jupiter's rings because there's there are finer particles that are visible there. Anyway, uh, that notion that uh, the, the Lorentz force can dominate motivates very tiny spacecraft. In the pursuit of that, we discovered that people were less interested in the actual uh, mission application of that. Although personally, I still find that really interesting, but instead, latched on to the idea of a really small spacecraft for lots of other applications. So one of the uh, applications that uh, became clear was uh, when the Breakthrough Starshot project, it's one of the ones you're referring to, um, came about, uh, Yuri Milner and his advisors uh, latched onto our research, the, the development of these chipsets, as a kind of existence proof that in fact you could create a spacecraft of some reasonable capability that maybe could serve as the basis for this interstellar mission. So it was, I was very proud that they found our research to be worthwhile. And uh, in fact, some of the earlier pictures from April of 2015, I think it was, uh, showing the kickoff for this project. You can see Yuri Milner and Stephen Hawking and Freeman Dyson and all sorts of awesome people, um, some of them holding up these little chipsets in front of the camera. So it's, uh, it's cool to see that. So that, that was the origin of, of our connection to that interstellar activity. Uh, and I've been on the advisory board now for the Breakthrough Starshot project for some time. Uh, learning a lot and um, trying to figure out how to make an interstellar version of the chip stack, chip set. So I had to talk to you more about that, but I feel I've already answered your question a very long way. So I'll <laughs> be more concise in my next one. Okay. Um, for those unfamiliar with it, what is the Interplanetary Transport Network and how does it work? So the ITN is, um, you could sort of think of it as a current, uh, the way a current uh, exists in the ocean. Uh, it is a set of uh, level contours of energy, if you can put up with that, that description, in the solar system that combines the effects of the spinning dynamics of objects in orbit and their gravity um, and represents a way in which objects or spacecraft in particular can travel across the solar system without expending so much, so much energy. Uh, the simplest version of this is what we do pretty often, and that's gravity assists or flybys for missions, right? Uh, you take the Cassini mission, for example, which flew by Venus, Earth twice, uh, and, and in the process managed to make its way to Saturn without, I think it was about uh, 2,500 meters per second of, uh, of delta V of, of propulsion uh, effect. So that's a very small number for what you normally have to do. Thanks to uh, traveling these contours, these, uh, again, sort of iso energy contours throughout the solar system, um, Cassini was able to cut down on the amount of propellant significantly and just made that mission possible. So taken in the abstract, this ITN, you could sort of imagine it as a map or, or as I said before, 
currents in the ocean. And if you've ever sailed, or maybe this is true for gliding, I've never been in a glider, but probably you could ride the thermals, so to speak, in a glider. You can ride the currents in an ocean. You can ride these iso energy contours in the solar system. Mm -hmm. So by analogy, that enables a vehicle to go very far without expending much energy. And for a spacecraft, of course, that means expending propellant. Uh, propellant is in finite supply. There are a few maybe exotic forms of propulsion that don't require propellant. Uh, that, by the way, that uh, Lorentz force effect, that's one of them. But they're not quite as useful or convenient as using propellant. So the ITN is, uh, again, in, in an abstract way, uh, a way of ensuring that you are uh, traveling with the least effort. I suppose there could be other analogies, like uh, the path that you take walking from uh, your home to the grocery store. You might choose not the fastest path, but the path with the least hills, because you don't want to be carrying your groceries up and down a hill. So ah. that's an analogy. Okay, okay. Um, during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, because of their low mass, these tiny chipsets may slow without producing a lot of heat. Uh, describe that, if you would, and also how their aerodynamic descent through the atmosphere may be a bit unconventional. Sure. Well, the the, the feature of these chipsets that they are more subject to uh, the things we normally call perturbations for larger spacecraft. That's the reason why, in fact, aerodynamic effects are so much more pronounced for these chipsets. So uh, what happens when a spacecraft enters the atmosphere? You know, it's been up there for a while, and and even at very high altitude, uh, I mean, hundreds, even thousands of kilometers from the surface of the Earth, there is a little bit of, I guess, what you could call atmosphere. It's, you know, plasma, it's neutral ions, it's uh, other stuff. Uh, but it does drag against the spacecraft to a degree. Uh, so spacecraft in lower Earth orbit tend to enter more quickly because they're swimming through that atmos upper atmospheric soup more than the higher uh, spacecraft. So keeping a spacecraft in orbit in low altitude just requires more propulsion, or if you just leave it alone, it'll enter faster. That same principle uh, affects chipsets. And in the case of chipsets, because the surface area effect of this drag is so much more pronounced than the gravity effect through its volume, as I said, it's like a cube square law kind of a thing. Uh, because of that, these chipsets enter the atmosphere more quickly. So first of all, that's an advantage because you don't want to leave all this orbital debris up there. So these chipsets tend to clean up after themselves, and that's a that's a big plus. I don't want to be a um, you know uh, the guy who polluted space with chipsets and caused the death of astronauts in the space station or something. So we very carefully talked about how it is that you need to plan these missions to ensure that they clean up after themselves, and that is possible. But specifically to your point about entry, once the spacecraft has entered the atmosphere, uh, the atmospheric density increases very quickly, and the spacecraft, depending on its mass, slows down either quickly or, or slowly. In the case of a typical spacecraft, it has so much mass and therefore so much momentum that the, the force of the atmosphere takes a long time to slow it down. And during that slowdown, that descent, the aerothermal heating, that is the friction of the atmosphere around the spacecraft, heats the thing up to the point where the surface can reach thousands of degrees. Uh, now, the space shuttle and other vehicles like it handle that with some kind of uh, a thermal protection system. So, for example, the tiles on the old space shuttle or the new Starship rocket that SpaceX is building that has similar tiles. Those tiles uh, will take the heat. In the case of the chipset, though, because it has such low mass and therefore low momentum, the forces of entry uh, slow it quickly, and therefore the spacecraft never reaches a high speed and therefore does not experience a lot of aerothermal heating, certainly compared to the larger spacecraft. It does experience some. So these uh, chipsets, depending on their, let's say, uh, aspect ratio, that is how, how, how wide or large they are compared to their thickness, if they are more like uh, pieces of tissue paper, you would think that they would burn up quickly, but actually it's the reverse. They slow down so quickly that they don't experience the high speed uh, friction effects that burn up other spacecraft. So the more diaphanous or, or you know, Kleenex-like you can make a spacecraft, the more likely it'll survive entry. Mm -hmm. So it's all about creating a, a slow entry. These chipsets naturally do that. And uh, although we have not yet been able to launch one uh, that uh, is of a sufficiently low density, so it would probably take, I'm gonna say about 10 centimeters and maybe um, much less than a gram worth of, of material. Although we haven't done that yet, we're close. We're coming up with it. We have a mission launching in a few months that will probably do, uh, we'll get pretty close to that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, that's a big advantage because if you can now enter a spacecraft without its needing to burn up uh, or without it's burning up, uh, you can accomplish a couple of things. 
for the space shuttle, obviously, you need to have those uh, astronauts survive, and that's why we do it. In the case of the chipsets, uh, you can take measurements. So this is a way of doing science on the way down from orbit all the way to the surface of the Earth with a single sensor continuously. There's a part of the atmosphere called the mesosphere, where, uh, and this is typically where spacecraft travel very quickly and experience aerothermal heating, at least part of it. Uh, it's too high for aircraft and too low for spacecraft. So really, we've hardly had any measurements at all of anything in the mesosphere, but it's a huge part of the atmosphere, the overall atmosphere of the Earth. So sometimes they call it the ignorosphere because we don't know what's in there. These chipsets could take measurements there. And the result could, I don't know if it'll re revolutionary, uh, revolutionize atmospheric science, but it'll be the first measurements of their type. Imagine thousands and no kidding, even millions of these chipsets descending through the upper atmosphere, taking data and relaying that to a ground station. You'd be able to map all sorts of phenomena that include uh, the, the vortices of the upper atmosphere and lots of things that would help understand uh, communications from the Earth, uh, the ability for other spacecraft to enter safely and, and so forth. So I think it's a real opportunity. One of the things I read online about the atmospheric, uh, traveling through the atmosphere, it mentioned that if they were like, say, the shape and size of a business card, that they might uh, tumble, flutter, and possibly even... Um, uh, spiral like a maple seed falling from a tree. Talk about the aerodynamic effects uh, that produce those things. That's right. Well, you, you know those maple seeds, at least for people in most parts of the country, uh, they've seen maple seeds, they call them samaras, as they, as they fall from the tree. That little helicopter behavior is what distributes the seeds. And what's going on, of course, is that thanks to the aerodynamics, uh, that seed can travel farther laterally and spread out the, the maples. DNA, I guess. So that's a good thing for the, the tree. Um, here, a similar idea. The more you can get the chipset to either flutter or maybe travel with its flat edge toward the, um, toward the wind, the slower it goes. And the slower it goes, well, first of all, we already said it uh, avoids that aerothermal heating, but also it can take more measurements. So it is a pretty fascinating set of behaviors that these, these, these flat objects undertake. Uh, it's a little hard to describe in a single uh, a single way, but uh, some of them do exhibit that kind of maple samara spinning and kind of uh, uh, kind of carves out a little floral pattern as it as it descends. Others uh, travel straight down like a, like a, a knife being thrown through the air. It's all a matter of some very subtle relationships between the surface area, the location of the center of mass, um, and some other either imperfections or intentional changes in the surface. So you can make these things spin like a helicopter, or you can make them travel flat and just kind of settle like a piece of paper falling down a flight of stairs. You could also imagine um, all sorts of other behaviors, including if you were to put some kind of an actuator, like a little, maybe a little piece of uh, piezoelectric material or a piece of uh, shape change alloy or something like that, uh, to shape the the, the 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 sides of the chipset, you could probably direct its descent and actually make it fly somewhere. So you could be bu building uh, flight surfaces, aerodynamic control surfaces. But it's a kind of a astonishing thing. We've done some experiments dropping large collections of appropriately shaped objects from a height, and you see these chaotic behaviors, widely differing behaviors. Again, there's the sort of knife through the air, there's the uh, um, you know, the sort of flutter back back and forth, there's the helicopter behaviors. Even if we design these things to be almost identical, the behavior bifurcates or splits up into these different classes of motions. So I think given the kind of chaotic nature of these things, and that's by the way, without any wind, you know, you throw wind into the mix, it's a whole other story. Given how complicated that is to predict, the way to really understand a chipset mission is through statistics. So it's really not about can one spacecraft survive? Can one object make it to Proxima Centauri or something like this? It's really about can you get the data you want out of the collective or out of the group of these chipsets? So the aerodynamics problem is one that we are now convinced needs a statistical approach. And it's not really one that I think lends itself to precise prediction. So instead, you'd have a landing ellipse, as they say for some of those Mars missions, or uh, a region of space that these chipsets can go into. Mm. Just to extend one more, one more direction, if you're interested in, let's say, exploring the solar system and you flung these chipsets out uh, from the Earth, 
they are also subject to perturbations are a little bit like the atmosphere, but different in, in certain ways. But they will kind of find their way through the interplanetary transport network to other places. Um, that statistical behavior is one where maybe you architect a space mission, not based on sending one thing precisely with a certain trajectory to your favorite planet. Instead, you count on millions of these things wandering around maybe aimlessly or certainly without the help of the Earth, but then encountering something of interest and telemetering that data back when they find it. Mm. And so worked out some math of that. It would take millions of those to make it happen. But remember, if these things weigh a gram, I can give you a thousand of them in a kilogram. I can give you a million of them in a thousand kilograms. And a thousand kilogram spacecraft is modest. That's a kind of average size, maybe flagship mission, but still average size spacecraft. So okay. it's completely unreasonable. Let's go with the SpaceX Starship, okay? 150 tons to Earth orbit. That'd be 150 million chipsets. Uh, it takes only about 50 million chipsets for there to be a 50% chance that one of them will travel the interplanetary transport ne network and impact a body of interest. So mm -hmm. one Starship mission could populate the solar system with these little autonomous Roomba uh, vehicles looking for science mm -hmm. and it's a different construct you appreciate from how we normally do space science okay well you've already answered one of my later questions and that is what is the one big experiment that uh, is not being done that everybody's ignoring and you wish would be done over the next 10 20 years yeah yeah that's pretty good <laughs> well that we can call that an experiment i will say that there's others uh, that are related mm -hmm. um you know setting aside interstellar travel for the moment just within the solar system there's a lot we don't know about asteroids and comets and uh, asteroid and comet encounters. Uh, we've done a few of them, right? The Japanese have done Hayabusa 1 and 2. There's OSIRIS-REx. There's DART. I guess you could count that. There's the NEAR mission. Uh, so there's been a few, uh, but uh, they've, it's really a few. In one shot, we could launch enough individual sensors to uh, create a kind of... Uh, we, could, we could sort of drop uh, glitter over on a, a, a single spacecraft each chipset being a piece of glitter, with the result that we could have a, a, a network of sensors virtually surrounding an entire asteroid and learn more about it from every perspective than we ever have with these single missions. Hmm. So that's one that's uh, it's like ready to go. I mean, we, we could do this today if we had the resources for it. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> some of the questions that I will ask you today are about your research and projects that I found on the webpage of the Space Systems Design Studio, uh, but the website contained no uh, about page. So let me ask you, what is the Space Systems Design Studio and who runs it? I run it. It is my research lab at Cornell University. Uh, the Space Systems Design Studio combines PhD level research um, and research by undergraduates and master's students. Uh, we typically start with big ideas at the PhD level. A student might spend three or four years working something out, something profound. Uh, chipsets are a good example. And then that might flow down to an undergraduate or master's level project where we try to actually fly a piece of hardware to demonstrate something of interest. So we've done now close to a dozen flight experiments through my lab over the last nearly 20 years. Um, and it's they've, we've had you know a mixture of success, as you would expect but enough that I haven't become completely uh, disillusioned yet. So uh, we continue to put things into space. And to me, that's important. I think for our results, our research results to be credible. Uh, we, If we're gonna come up with something a little crazy, uh, we've got to be able to show that it'll actually work. Um, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof as uh, I'm just a pair of various uh, Carl Sagan. So that's one of those uh, key parts of our lab that we take seriously going from both the very low technology readiness ideas to something that actually flies. And if, if we're successful, demonstrates the viability of the idea. It's kind of like we told you so, but that's the, that's the goal there. That was Dr. Mason Peck. This has been From Here to the Stars, a video series produced by the Interstellar Research Group. The IRG is a nonprofit organization dedicated to thoroughly exploring the science and engineering that can eventually open up the reality of interstellar travel. Find out more about our next symposium at irg.space. I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb.
If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and you can subscribe to our channel for other such videos. On behalf of all of us here at the Interstellar Research Group, I thank you.